Good evening, welcome to the overnight edition of From Day One. Graham Hancock and Art Bell is back. Let's pick up their final section now. Mysteries from the past, which I have an, an, a, a, really an intimate and detailed knowledge of. I don't need the kind of level of technology that you need to cross into stellar space in order to explain them. A much simpler, much more elegant explanation is that we are a species with amnesia, that there has been a forgotten episode of human history, that there was an advanced civilization in the past, and that that advanced civilization, human civilization, lies at the source of all the archaeological mysteries, which doesn't do away with aliens and other intelligences. I would believe that civilization was in contact with them just as we are. But I don't think that those alien and other intelligences built the Great Pyramid. I think the Great Pyramid was the work of human beings. And what do you think the purpose of the Great Pyramids would be? Multi, <laughs> multi-dimensional multi purpose. Many, many things. But one thing the Great Pyramid is for sure is a gigantic instrument that works on human consciousness. Oh, uh, you thank can, you. You, oh, you can thank see you. this effect. You can see this effect at work in the faces of all of us who are drawn to the Great Pyramid. People come from all over the world. It's like a beacon, even in these troubled times in Egypt. And Egypt is going through very troubled times at the moment. That beacon reaches out and 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 calls to us, and and we all. So many people feel that at some time in their lives they need to make contact with the Great Pyramid. And let's, let's ask ourselves why that should be. And I think it's because it works on human... But first and foremost, it was designed to elevate and accentuate human consciousness. Okay, well, this is the absolute truth, uh, my friend. I, I got to lay in that sarcophagus, and I felt something very powerful. I don't know if it was my own mind... That, you know, sort of telling me I should be feeling that because I'm in this exotic place, but I felt something very strong. And um, well, me too. I've I've also had the privilege to lie down in that sarcophagus. And if you tone in there, you know, if you make a if you make a, a yes. note, it's just incredible what happens with the vibration around you. You can almost feel right. the veil between worlds thinning, uh, and and feel yourself encountering other other levels of reality that that you might never have imagined were there before. There are many ways to alter human consciousness, and I've explored quite a number of those myself. But the Great Pyramid is, um, is an astonishing instrument for developing, I would say, for, it, for enhancing the potential of human consciousness. And All right, I, I want to very quickly, because, yeah. you know, time is so short, I want to ask you about this. The Arab so-called spring... Yeah. Um, I, what to say about it? Are you uh, fearing the possibility of the destruction of so much that could be destroyed in Egypt? I mean, God knows, we have no idea what's going to happen. Even Italy is being threatened as yeah. this disaster spreads across. Yes. Well, unfortun unfortunately, in fundamentalist Islam, uh, we have um, uh, within it, there, there are many great people in Islam, but within fund fundamentalist Islam, there is a kind of death cult operating at the moment, yes. uh, which, which uh, hates the past. It cannot bear the past, it, perhaps because it realizes that the past holds the key to unwinding the whole edifice of control that the mainstream religions represent. I don't separate Islam from Christianity and Judaism in this sense. Uh, Christianity, of course, has had to has had to give way uh, to the Enlightenment, and uh, but there are still fundamentalist Christians who would impose their vision on others, just as there are fundamentalist Muslims and just as there are fundamentalist Jews. At the end of the day, all these three religions worship the same God, you know, Jehovah, Allah, Yahweh, whatever whatever you want to call him. He's the God of Abraham. He's the same the same God in 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 all cases. And unfortunately, I think the the common point is fundamentalism. When people get when 
people get so carried away with their beliefs that they're actually prepared to kill somebody else because of their beliefs. Yes. And you know you're dealing with a true psychotic. And unfortunately, these true psychotics are now uh, in large numbers around the world, and they appear to be dedicated to the destruction of our past. So when I say we're a species with amnesia, it's not just because we've suffered cosmic cataclysms in the past. It's also because human beings again and again have deliberately rubbed out the past. Christian mobs used to do that in Egypt in the 4th and 5th centuries AD. You go around the Egyptian temples, you'll see many of the figures pecked out. Somebody's taken a hammer and a chisel and just pecked them out. Well, that was Christians who did that at a time when Christians were locked in the fundamentalist mindset. And this is what we need to free ourselves from if we're to move forward as a species. By all means, have spiritual values and spiritual beliefs. But never, ever, ever impose those values and beliefs on others. All right. Uh, All right. That's the moment it. you do that, you're lost. Right. Hold it right there. Okay. Graham Hancock is my guest. Can you imagine that? If those people ever got their hands on Egypt in totality. This is Midnight. Which are the psychedelics? 
Uh, You're a great uh, guy. You do your own segues. It's just where I was going to take you. Let me back up a little bit. I heard okay. I heard a rumor that I'd like to confirm or deny on. Okay. okay. I heard that you went uh, long ago to a show somewhere and said that you felt that you had had enough marijuana. Oh yeah, I did. Um, I did actually, I, I, and that's um, that, that's absolutely true. Um, I was, uh, but let's not uh, include marijuana amongst the psychedelic. No, no um, well, although, although it is a it is a, a, an intriguing consciousness altering agent. Yes. Um, and and I'm very excited by what's happening in America that the American people step state by state are asserting their independence and rolling back that absurd, monstrous enterprise. Isn't it America. amazing? It's amazing. It's, a, it's an incredible thing. I was in Colorado in May, and I just, I just love the fact that there is a place where adults are actually treated like adults. Yes. Because in the rest of the world, adults are treated like children when it comes to their own consciousness. Uh, if, if there's anything that we should be sovereign over, that we should be able to make absolutely sovereign decisions over, it's our own consciousness. Yes. And yet, in all of the Western societies, uh, the keys to our consciousness are held by the state. And if we explore our consciousness in non orthodox ways, using, for example, psychedelics, then the state will ruin our lives That's right. and break down the doors and That's send right. us to prison. There's a grotesque abuse of human rights that's taking place under the name of the so-called war on drugs. I'm not advocating drugs. I'm not telling people, go out and take drugs. What I'm advocating is adult responsibility. As adults, we should be able to make decisions about our own bodies, our own health, our own minds, and our own consciousness. We don't need the state to tell us what to do. So I'm thrilled that places like Colorado have rolled back this invasion of adult sovereignty and have reimposed the right of adults to make decisions about their own consciousness regarding marijuana. Me too. I, 20 years ago, I said, it's got to be legal, and people went, ah! And then they talked about murders and that, you know, the whole thing. All, anyway, all the usual nonsense that's talked, that's talked about to frighten us and terrify yes, us. Yes, yes, yes. That's what governments do. They seek to press our fear buttons. Yes. And in the process, they reveal themselves as liars. Uh, and that's what Colorado and the other states that have legalized uh, marijuana are in the process of proving, that all of those horror stories and all those horror predictions that were supposed to come out when marijuana was legalized turn out to be myths, and that actually crime falls. Go, Graham, go. <laughs> useful project. You know, yes. the criminal gangs are put out of business. And all of it comes from respecting the right of adults to make decisions about their own consciousness, a right that should never have been taken away from us in the first place. All right. Now I wish to ask you about something well, uh, a little... Well, let me a question about, about marijuana, because well, the, uh, well, this, is, this is... Since you asked me it, I might as well answer it. Well, keep going, okay? Okay. And, and what, what happened was that um, I was a, a big user of marijuana for many, 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 many years. Right. Um, I, I started late, actually. I started about the age of 37. Um, but by the time I was in my 40s, I was smoking marijuana all day long. Uh, from morning to night, oh uh, I was writing my books under the influence of marijuana, oh um, and and it came to the point where I was smoking it 16 hours a day. Later on, I turned to vaporizers and started using vaporizers, much better for your lungs than combustion products from smoke. But uh, I was abusing this herb. It's not the fault of the herb. It's me. It's my own personality, my own uh, nature. Uh, I enjoyed it so much that I just wanted to do it all the time. And it began to have uh, negative effects on my personality. And then I was in Brazil, in, in Brazil for a series of sessions with ayahuasca, mm -hmm. which is a powerful psychedelic yes. that has been used in the Amazon for thousands and thousands of years. And during these sessions, I had a series of encounters with uh, what I construed to be an intelligent entity. Many people refer to her as Mother Ayahuasca, the spirit behind the vine. Uh, and I was, uh, I was, it was made clear to me that I had to change my relationship to cannabis radically. Uh, and in, and uh, uh, otherwise, I was really on a, on, on a slippery slope. It wasn't serving me anymore. I was serving it. Well, uh, was this for your new mistress, Ayahuasca? Well, 
you wonder about the conflict between the spirits behind the herbs. But here, so here's what here's what happened. I gave up cannabis for for three years, and um, I I feel I can now have a, a relationship with cannabis again, but never on that abusive level where I would do it 16 hours a day. I think it, like any other powerful substance, it has to be treated with respect. And my problem was I wasn't treating it with respect. I've, I've learned that lesson now, and it was a lesson that I needed to learn. I think to some degree, I would make the statement that I believe that um, marijuana in milder amounts, perhaps, than you're talking about, uh, contributes to creativity. Now, oh, definitely. Definitely? Really? Definitely. No doubt, no doubt about it. Look, not for everyone. You know, we all have different body chemistry. Very true. There's, there's some, some people that marijuana doesn't serve at all. Um, just as there are some, you know, some people that other that other medicines don't serve, mm -hmm. but but others definitely there is a breakthrough in creativity. I don't think I would have written any of my books of historical mystery if I had not uh, started smoking marijuana at the age of 37. Really, back in 1987, just a couple of years before I began to work seriously on the book that became the Sign and the Seal, I was already doing that research. But when I began to think of it as a book, I have to say marijuana played a part in that. Uh, Fingerprints of the Gods, the, the book that I'm best known for, um, was written entirely under the influence of marijuana. Uh, I, I wrote from morning to night, and I smoked from morning to night. Uh, and and, and I, I have no doubt that it loosens up creative processes in my mind, at any rate, but okay. only if it's treated with respect. If I then, what I then went on to do was to make this the centerpiece of my life, and that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I was shown that mistake very clearly in a series of visions with ayahuasca, and the net effect was that I quit marijuana for three for three years. And All right, now I, ayahuasca is not something I have never done. So if if you're able to do it, I would love you to describe your experiences with it. Okay, um, it's interesting. I, I mean, ayahuasca is now becoming quite a, a you know a feature in in pop culture, and you have various pop stars and artists who are who are oh, yes. taking I, ayahuasca. Uh, uh, it's been around for thousands and thousands of years. The archaeological evidence traces the use of ayahuasca in the Amazon back more than five thousand years. It probably goes back a whole lot further than that. Um, it means the vine of souls in the Quechua language of the Andes. That's what ayahuasca actually means, the vine of souls or the vine of the dead. And, and its particular property is its ability to connect us with the realm of the dead and with the deceased. Um, and, and very often it's the case when we, when we lose someone close to us that we have unfinished business with them. And one of the things that ayahuasca can do is enable you to reconnect with that person in the realm of spirit. The other thing, it does, it does many things. Um, but first and foremost, let me describe the process. It's made of two jungle plants, the ayahuasca vine and uh, a bush that is called chacruna in the Amazon. Uh, the botanical name is C Cicotria viridis, and the leaves of that bush contain dimethyltryptamine, DMT, the most powerful hallucinogen known to man. Now, normally, DMT can't be absorbed orally. There's an enzyme in the gut called monoamine oxidase that neutralizes DMT. So if you try to drink DMT in any form, the monoamine oxidase in the gut will shut it off. And this is where, you know, we have to reckon with the very clever ethnopharmacology of the Amazonian peoples because the other element of the brew, the ayahuasca vine itself, contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. It switches off that enzyme in the gut and allows the DMT in the leaves to be absorbed orally, producing a journey, uh, a, a, an exploration of the far side of reality that can last up to four hours. Whereas uh, DMT in its pure fo form smoked is a rocket ship to the other side of reality that will just take you there for like 12 minutes and then you're back in this space. Ayahuasca allows a much longer, much deeper, much more reflective journey, a journey over which you have some control. If you don't like where you're being taken, you can object and stop the journey uh, or at least pause it. Um, there's much more negotiation with ayahuasca. Tastes bad, T horrible taste, one of the most ghastly tastes on the planet. Nobody, 
need imagine that anybody is drinking ayahuasca for kicks. It makes you vomit. It gives you diarrhea. Oh, my. It, it also, so at a physical level, it's very tough. But it also plunges you into this seamlessly convincing parallel universe where you do encounter what appear to be other intelligences. Now, some scientists would say that they're just phantasms of our own minds. It's just our brain on drugs. And maybe they're right. But I don't agree with them. I think that what's happening is that the receiver wavelength of the brain is being retuned by DMT. And we are gaining access to other levels of reality. And those other levels of reality appear to have an interest in the planet. Other levels of reality, or do you think possibly other dimensions? Well, that's what I mean, really. I, yes. I, by other levels of reality, I mean other dimensions. I guess we could define reality perhaps as this dimension. Yeah, that's yeah. what we call reality, is this right. dimension that we can access with our five senses, that we can weigh, measure, and count, that we can investigate with science, and so on and so forth. Um, but the revolutionary possibility that is being raised by quantum physics and that ayahuasca raises at the level of experience mm -hmm. is that there are freestanding other dimensions that are aware of us, even though we may not usually be aware of them. Did you, in, in your opinion, did you encounter another intelligence? Absolutely. De definitely so. This is what I, what I feel I've encountered. It's a bit like an ancient Greek account encountering the goddess Athena. You know, there, there's an intelligence that speaks to you and communicates with you. And I realize that, you know, anybody who's not had this experience may regard that as slightly lunatic. But I would say, you know, withhold your judgment if you get the chance have some sessions with ayahuasca. It's available in the United States now. A couple of ayahuasca churches from Brazil even function legally in the United States, the Unia de Vegetal and, and the Santo Deme. It's possible to have a legal experience with ayahuasca uh, on the grounds of religious belief in the United States. And, really? Uh, it's a very interesting experience. Now, I was not aware that you could do that legally. Well, you have to, you have to in, at least in token, join one of these churches. Um, when I say churches, they're, they're the rather typical syncretic uh, Brazilian spiritual traditions that mix together the aspects of many different religions. But both the Unia de Vegetal, the UDV, and the Santo Deme uh, have chapters in the United States. They have got Supreme Court exemption for their members to drink ayahuasca, because again, this is one of the great, the great things about the United States, you know, is that, that, that there is this, this record recognition um, that we do have certain rights and those rights include the right to sacred space okay hold it right there we're gonna break uh, so in other words praise the Lord pass the ayahuasca <laughs> <laughs> all right hold it right there Graham Hancock is my guest good uh, morning afternoon evening whatever it is wherever you are this is midnight in the desert <laughs> Canadian, 
uh, just came in. Somebody up in Canada calls himself the Canadian Walrus, and um, and he says, you know, your guest Graham has just lost all his credibility and respect in my book, and and this person read your books and loved them, but now that they've heard that you wrote them under the influence of marijuana, all respect is gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm quite used to that. Um, you know, it's unfortunately the case that, that the very large majority of our populations have been brainwashed by 40 plus years of a mental conditioning exercise called the war on drugs. And we now have, at a social level, deep-rooted knee-jerk reactions, which it's impossible for people to overcome. I mean, my view is if my work was valuable before it was revealed that uh, I used marijuana when I wrote it, then it should still be valuable afterwards. I mean, the work is the work, you know, uh, and perhaps it can be can be separated from the person who uh, who produced it. The work stands. If the work was good before, uh, it should still be good. Um, and uh, if it can be, it, it, you, you know, if, if somebody can change their view on the quality of a piece of work because of the mental state of the individual who produced that piece of work at that time, uh, you know, that that person was uh, exploring an altered state of consciousness, if that writes off the work, then nothing much I can do about it. You know, no, I suppose not. But I, I believe in I believe in being upfront with my readers about who I am and what I do, and uh, I think all the states of consciousness are important. I wrote my book Supernatural to show that uh, that the embracing of altered states of consciousness by our ancestors thirty or forty thousand years ago was undoubtedly what switched on the modern human mind. Uh, and some of the greatest thinkers of our time. I mean, I wonder if you're if the person who sent you that message has, uh, you know, also written off all the work of Carl Sagan, you know, because Carl Sagan was a great advocate of marijuana and uh, a, a very big user of marijuana. I wonder if they're going to write off the work of Francis Crick, the discoverer of the double helix of DNA, because Francis Crick regularly used LSD in the early 1950s and late 1940s. Well, we'll see if I get another message. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Steve Jobs, you know, yes. Uh, LSD played a huge role in the creation of the Apple computer. So we can either shut our eyes and our ears to all these facts and just bow down uh, to the war on drugs and to the war on our minds that it has involved, uh, or we can think for ourselves. That's a free choice for every individual. Okay, so he now says he's turning off his computer permanently. That's okay. (laughs) Just kidding, I added that. Um, All right, I I want to know a little more about the communication you had under ayahuasca. It obviously stopped you from the marijuana use or taught you something about that use. It interrupted my marijuana use and told me that that if I were to continue with it, it would need to be in a much more respectful manner. I realized that I am using a sacred medicinal herb here, uh, not a crutch to lean on uh, 16 hours a day. Uh, and and that is a that was a very important realization for me. Uh, marijuana, in my opinion, is very valuable in mm-hmm. stimulating creative insight, but it's also very seductive, uh, and it can and she can draw you down into this into this place where you really don't do all that much. I mean, I, these days I would not write a book under the influence of marijuana. Um, I'm I, I'd rather I'd rather um, not spend you know, the entire day puzzling over a single paragraph. <laughs> Did that really go on or were there... Yes, it went, it went on. It went on. I write faster now and, uh, uh, you know, I believe I believe better. The The inspiration is, is still there, but the, you know, putting it down, putting it down on words, I don't, I don't want to be uh, smoking marijuana. Were there no. any other valuable communications while using ayahuasca? I'm very curious about that. Well, most imp- most important of all, um, it's well recognized amongst amongst those who drunk ayahuasca that you go through a kind of life review. You get to look at episodes from your life and, and your interactions with other people, not from your own point of view, but from their point of view. And this uh, can show you uh, that you may not have been as kind and welcoming and nurturing and as positive an influence as you imagined you were. I was going to say, it's a frightening thing to go through as a review of your own life. It's a frightening thing to go through, and it's why ayahuasca is sometimes described as 20 years of psychotherapy in one night. (laughs) Uh, And it's why people 
burst into tears in ayahuasca sessions because you suddenly get it from the other person's point of view that actually you hurt them really badly that time. Those words that you said that you thought uh, you know were perfectly justified uh, turned out to be a, a cruel attack on another person, and you see that from that other person's point of view. So what it's doing is it's not it's not asking you to welter in self-pity about how negatively you behaved in the past. It's saying, listen, this is the truth about you. You want to do something about it? Well, now you know the truth. You can. Wow. You can do something about it. You get to see you get to see yourself as you've never seen yourself before, and that gives you the uh, opportunity to change your behavior. You know what you're what you're describing. What you're describing sounds an awful lot like an NDE. Yes, a near-death experience. It's very similar to a near-death experience. And again, let's remember, this is the vine of souls or the vine of the dead. It is, it is very similar to an induced near-death experience and that sense of passing through a tunnel and of encountering spirits of the deceased is a very common part of the ayahuasca journey. Uh, and again, we're dealing with the mystery of consciousness here. Yes. And I happen to believe that we should use uh, all of these ancient plant technologies because that's what they are. They're ancient plant technologies that have been used in shamanistic culture for tens of thousands of years. We should deploy them to exploring the mystery of consciousness, which is truly the greatest mystery of all. Really, outer space can wait as far as I'm concerned. Let's get to grips with inner space first. Once we've settled all of that, then we might be uh, more mature and in better shape to begin our exploration of the outside world. All right, I've really got to quickly ask you about this, and that is clearly, no matter what you believe, global warming, man caused just changes going on that are some somehow natural. It really is changing very quickly now. Uh, well, look, what, the world's climate, uh, the geology bears witness to the fact that the world's climate can change radically overnight. This has happened many times in the past. Um, before the last ice age set in, go back 130, 140,000 years ago, and you find yourself in a time of massive climate instability with huge rises and falls in temperature. 12,800 years ago, induced by comet impact, you have, you have the extraordinary climate change of the, of, of the younger Dryas. Uh, huge factors are at work in the climate of the Earth. It's a very complicated system. Undoubtedly, one of those factors is human beings, but we're not the only factor at all, and we'd be stupid to think we are. Do you think we're, we're beginning uh, something that, as at least as humans, we've got a pretty delicate balance, uh, Graham, and uh, so are we moving towards something that is not going to sustain us? Well, as long as we remain motivated by green interest, yes, that's the, that's the case. That's, that's true of the general damage we're doing to the planet, irrespective of the argument about, about climate change. Uh, the general damage, you know, I, 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 I think we need, I've said already, we need to recognize there are many factors at work that influence the climate of planet Earth. It's a delicately balanced system, and humanity is undoubtedly one of those factors. But what we need to do, I think what we need to do is focus less on climate and climate change as such, and more on our own behavior for the sake of looking at our own behavior. What is it we're doing in the world today that is really good and helpful for the future? And what is it that we're doing in the world today that's negative? and destructive and dark. And the human project, regardless of issues like climate, the human project should be to fill ourselves with light and to eliminate the darkness as much as possible. So anything we do as nations that is damaging to this gorgeous garden of a planet that we live on yes. is something we should stop doing because it's right to stop doing it, regardless of what happens to climate. All right, all right. Listen, will you come back in this final segment and at least answer a question or two from the audience? Of course. I'd love to hear from the audience. All right. All right. If, if, if any of them are still with us, I'll try it. Oh, they are. They are. They are. They are. Stay right there. This is Midnight in the Desert. I'm Art Bell.
Given the fundamental importance of our DNA, it is logical to assume that damage to it is undesirable and spells bad news. After all, we know that cancer can be caused by mutations that arise from such injury. But a surprising new study is turning that idea on its head with the discovery that brain cells actually break their own DNA to enable us to learn and form memories. While that may sound counterintuitive, it turns out that the damage is necessary to allow the expression of a set of genes called early response genes, which regulate various processes that are critical in the creation of long-lasting memories. These lesions are rectified pronto by repair systems, but interestingly, it seems that this ability deteriorates during aging, leading to a buildup of damage that could ultimately result in the degeneration of our brain cells. These findings could have important implications because earlier work has demonstrated that aging is associated with a decline in the expression of genes involved in the processes of learning and memory formation. It therefore seems likely that the DNA repair system deteriorates with age, but at this stage it is unclear how these changes occur. So the researchers plan to design further studies to find out. Tales of black-eyed children began appearing on online forums in the late 1990s. Explanations as to what they are include alien-human hybrids, demon-possessed children, and crypto-terrestrials. Regardless of their origin, one thing is certain. They're terrifying. Recently, reports of black-eyed kids' sightings have resurfaced. Black-eyed children have become a staple in conversations of the strange and unknown, and almost every reported encounter is eerily similar. Children as young as six years old to adult age approach people alone or with a partner and beg for help. Please let us in. Give us a ride. Follow us here. Permission to enter is always a legendary trait of a vampire. For some reason, these children frighten you. And as your hand reaches up to open the door, you see why. Their eyes are black, no iris, no whites, just an empty, soulless void. Many are convinced that these children and people like them aren't human, at least not anymore. It is unspecified what happens should you comply with their demands, as no reports of the black-eyed kids have included that happening, possibly indicating the death of those that comply. Whatever these entities are, the fact is people around the globe are encountering beings that look human, but are something else, something dark. Organizers of a Russian town's annual mosquito festival said this year's event will include a most delicious girl contest for women who don't mind bug bites. The festival features the contest with women in shorts and vests standing still for 20 minutes to allow the blood-sucking insects to feast. This is Dark Matter News. The world's first full head transplant could take place as soon as 2017 if the controversial plans by Italian neuroscientist Dr. Sergio Canavero come to pass. Wheelchair-bound Valerie Spirdinov, who has the muscle-wasting Weirdnik Hoffman disease, has volunteered to have his head transplanted onto a healthy body in a day-long operation. The proposed surgery is highly controversial, and its feasibility has been questioned by experts. But Dr. Canavero's plans also raise complex philosophical and ethical issues. A natural question is whether a living person with Spiridonov's head and someone else's body would be the same person as Spiridonov. If what matters to Spiridonov is mental continuity as well as having a healthy body, then it will not be possible to determine whether the surgery is successful in these terms until after the event. The impact of head transplants on our mental lives remains unknown. For Dark Matter News, I'm Leo Ashcraft.
Graham, I know it's going to be hard, uh, but it's, you know, try to keep it short and... <laughs> Really, I, I, like I say, I'm, I'm so, I'm so brimming with new information. It's very difficult to keep it, uh, to keep it short. But I, I'll do my best. I can clearly hear that. All right, let's give it a try. Somewhere in California, it's midnight, and you're on the air. Yeah, hi, Art. This is a war calling and running in Springs, California, and um, I'm listening on 1050 AM in Loma Linda. Yes. And I just want to say, first of all, Uber Roswell to you, Art, for uh, being back. Thank you. Yeah, and hello, Bell Gabbers. But, um, Graham, I had a question for you. Um, I really respect how passionate you are. And, uh, you know, you were looking for an explanation, maybe the, you know, <laughs> anthropologist or whatever, but you, you seem to be an explorer of consciousness. And I, I think uh, I, you really kind of define what that term is. And, uh, you know, you think you're, you're either, you know, uh, scaring the people out there, but you're not. You're really putting us on fire. Um, I myself well, had an experience. Yeah, I, I, I myself had an experience, but... Uh, yeah, I used to be really, you know, I used to look at this stuff as sort of all new agey and everything else, but, you know, the more I've gotten into biology, the more that I feel like we're missing a connection that we're having mm -hmm. between, you know, between us and plants. I mean, they really are the yin to our yang. All right, hold on right there. Absolutely, absolutely. Plant intelligence, you know, this is, a, we have to realize we're not the only intelligent species on this planet. Uh, you know, plants may manifest their intelligence in a different way, but the way that plants can affect human consciousness is quite extraordinary and I believe deliberate. So there is a connection, uh, there, or there can be a connection. Uh, somebody else, uh, let me see, I get these messages while I'm on the air, and they really want to know, uh, again, if you received any other important messages uh, while on ayahuasca. Well, yes, and it's the simplest message of all, you know. We need to set aside hate and fear and suspicion. We have to stop fearing one another, both at a personal, individual level and at national levels as well. And we have to manifest love. Uh, for too much of my life, I did not, I did not manifest love. Uh, ayahuasca, more than anything else, has taught me that that's our central mission here. That's what we're actually here to do. Uh, and while we cannot change our past, we can make sure that we act in a more loving and positive way in the future. All right, and off to Hilo, Hawaii we go. Hello, it's midnight, you're on. Yes, aloha, Art and Graham. Uh, Hi. My name is Pete. Hi, Pete. Um, okay, here on the Big Island, we have an actual church of the ayahuasca mm -hmm. where they actually do ceremonies and stuff like that. Yeah, excellent, which is, again, you know, the Supreme Court has granted uh, legal exemption uh, for, for members of the ayahuasca churches to work with this extraordinary blue. Yep, they sure have. Um, okay, so my, my question is, is uh, in the ancient cultures and stuff like that, they used mushrooms and psychedelics and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, they, the neurological diseases that we seem to have now in our mm -hmm. society, like Parkinson's and stuff like that, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, did they did they have it back then? Because I, I I haven't really been able to find anything that shows anything that, that I think you know, I think they had it much less. Um, what, one thing that's come clear to me from my study of ancient civilizations is that the use of psychedelic plants was very extensive in the ancient world, and I think it led to uh, healthy civilizations uh, in the past and healthy individuals. I think that our society today is the opposite of that. You know, we think we've got all the truth, but actually our society is just a little pimple on the backside of history. You know, history is a gigantic, deep and ancient, and, you know, modern technological society, which has been fighting the so-called war on drugs for, you know, 40 years, is a really recent comer. And actually, it's our civilization that is the aberration. We are out of step with the human story. Uh, we are medicating our populations massively, often against their will, with deeply dangerous pharmaceutical drugs. And at the same time, we are denying our population access to the healing powers of ancient visionary plants that have been trial tested in human society for thousands and thousands of years. And obviously, this is a huge mistake, and it, it manifests in the in what I call the unconsciousness and the insanity of modern technological society. All right, let me try Skype. James, uh, wherever you are, you're on midnight. G'day, uh, this is James from Adelaide, Australia. Perhaps your first international caller from last night's test show. Uh, you uh, are. We had many last night, but yes, uh, from Australia, you're on with Graham. Yes. G'day, Graham. Um, I actually got to meet uh, uh, 
David Hatcher Childress last week at my very first UFO conference oh, in David Melbourne, David. as well as um, Eric von Daniken. But uh, uh, I had a question too. regarding the ancient uh, destruction that you talk about. Have yeah. you at all looked into the information in the Billy Meyer case regarding the uh, great catastrophe of over 11,000 years ago and the destruction of Atlantis? No, I haven't looked into the Billy Meyer case. I have looked into an enormous amount of information on the destruction of Atlantis, and it, uh, and it plays an important role in my new book. But the Billy Meyer case has escaped me. Tell me more. Uh, well, I think you pretty much know what Billy Meyer is about, right? And the sightings he had, the pictures he posted, and all the rest of that, right? No, I really haven't followed it. I oh, well, right. then that's, that's a whole other story. Let's go to uh, Kayleen, is that right? Kayleen Park? K Kayleen, is that right? Uh, Keelan. Keelan, I'm sorry. Uh, welcome to the know. program. It's midnight and you're on. Uh, well, Art, it's wonderful to be on the air with you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Sam, not your first Australian call. I would have liked to be. I was wondering <laughs> if Mr. Hitchcock, uh, was it Hitchcock? Hancock, by the way. Sorry. Oh, Hancock. Hancock. Hancock, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was wondering if Mr. Hancock had any opinions on the unknown bears. Uh, I can't pronounce it. It's German. Uh, their work with psychedelics during World War II. The use of the of psychedelics by the Germans in World War II. Uh, yes. What I can tell you is psychedelics are powerful agencies. They can be used for good or for ill. All is not sweetness and light in the psychedelic garden. The ancient Aztecs used psychedelics as part of their uh, human sacrifice rituals. Um, it, the fact that one uses a psychedelic does not automatically mean that one is a good person. Uh, it's the intention that is brought to the psychedelic experience that matters. And if very negative and dark intentions are brought to it, then the consequences can be extremely negative and dark. And it wouldn't surprise me uh, if the death cult of the Nazis uh, made use of these substances to uh, enhance their occult powers. That is unfortunately uh, the case with these... Um, with these psychedelic instruments. And they are used also in shamanistic cultures. There are healers, curanderos, and there are sorcerers, brujos. Uh, what matters is the choices we make and the intention we bring to the experience. If that intention is positive, it is filled with love, it is filled with light, then so also will be the experience. Dion? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hancock. That was an interesting answer. Okay. Uh, I wish I knew more about your work so I could uh, discuss it with you. But well, there are. Uh, well, there are. Wait a minute now. There are right, books. And you'll find out all about it. Right. GrahamHancock.com. I'll have to have a look in. Thank all you, right. Mr. Hancock. Right. Thank you, Art. Thank you very much. And take care. Let's go back to the phones. And you're on the air. Hi. It's midnight. You're Hi. On Hi. Hi, Art. Hello. Hi, uh, Gra Hi, Graham. Hi there. Hi. Uh, hi, um, I, I watched um, um, uh, some, one of your interviews with Art um, probably uh, a couple of years ago, and I was just uh, wondering if I can uh, ask a question about uh, something you said. Um, you can ask a question about anything you like. Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, I remember you saying something about um, the Sphinx, in, uh, or a Sphinx in Egypt, or something like that, and uh, you said... Um, that uh, there was like water marks on the side of it or something. Uh, like, uh, okay. Yes, I was talking. I was talking about what is called the precipitation-induced weathering of the Sphinx. The fact, the fact that the Sphinx, at some point in its long history, the Great Sphinx of Giza, was subjected to thousands of years of heavy rainfall. You have not had that rainfall in Egypt in the historic period in the last 5,000 years. You have to go back to the end of the last ice age, to the cataclysm between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. You have to go back all that way to find the kind of rain in Egypt that could have caused the weathering we see on the body of the Sphinx. Therefore, Professor Robert Schock at Boston University and John Anthony West have championed this case for many years now. Therefore, the Sphinx must be more than 12,000 years old. Okay, going to the um, uh, Skype line, uh, Triana, I think it is. Hello. Hello? Triana, are you there? Going once, going twice, and gone. So we'll go to uh, the international Skype, and I think we've got somebody named Pete. Hello, Pete. Hello. Yes. Uh, turn off your device, please. It's off. Okay, do you have a... Where are you, first of all? I'm in the Philippines. In the Philippines? 
I'm in Makati's old, uh, in Art's old hometown of Makati. <laughs> My first Philippine call. Um, okay, well, you're on with Graham Hancock. All right, awesome. Great, great to hear you. I have a first a question about Makati. Um, you used to live here? Yes. Where did you live? Um, what, what building? Bon well, I'm not going to tell you what building. Bonifacio, okay. Bonifacio Global City. Ah. That much wow. I'll say. You, you won't even recognize the fort now. The fort is I know. booming changed. with construction. I'm sure it's changed, yes. First Avenue, if that helps you. Okay, great, great. I'm sure I can figure out from there. And where's your wife from? Is she from the province? Or from no, the she city is. Or? No, she's from there now. Um, now, anyway, we've got a guest. So do you have a question? Quick question for Graham. Yes. I love traveling, and I love old temple complexes. I've been to the pyramids in Egypt. I've been to Chichen Itza, uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, Java, have okay. places like that, yes. Thailand, so you've Angkor Wat. been to Barabador in Java. Yes. Java is amazing. Do you recommend yeah. any other places Angkor. in Asia, especially that are you know powerful? The energy, I really like the, the energy feel, the, the yeah. thing you feel in your chest, like you're somewhere special. Yeah, one word answer: Angkor in Cambodia. Oh, I've been there. Yeah, spent a week there and still didn't see everything. Amazing and majestic. And be there at, on the spring equinox. Be there on the twenty-first of March at dawn, and you'll see something amazing happen. Yeah, That's I was in Tikal on an equinox, the and the temple they like fire fires on the peaks of the temples, and they all line up in a row mm -hmm. at night, and it's amazing to see. And then it lines up with the moon. Rise. The ancient, the ancient were masters of a lost science of connection of sky and ground as above so below okay well uh, thank you very much from the Philippines that is uh, that was sort of home uh, let's go back to the phone lines and say Royal Oak I think in Michigan uh, you're on midnight hello hello, hello. Uh, glad to be on I'm uh, listening to I believe 7490 on shortwave. Um, it's coming in great here in Michigan. Yeah, hey. Yes, that's true. We're on shortwave. We're all over the place. I think I'm trying to get the call sign, I believe, WCBQ. I'm so glad you found us. Yes, yeah, so anyway, I'm glad to be on and uh, enjoying the interview. Um, in your introduction, you mentioned the mother culture, and um, this was before we had our Australian call callers, but it made me think of um, something in Aborigine practices, um, the symbolic death, sacred rebirth, mm -hmm. um, basically the initiation rites, um, they kidnap when a child comes of age, it's sort of a faux kidnapping into a cave, he reemerges as a sort of a symbolic rebirth, becoming an adult. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, of course, such, such rituals are found all around the world. Oh, yeah, yes, I was just going to say. That as, in, as in being reborn, for example. Sure. Yes, it even plays into the uh, rites of Freemasonry, um, all kinds of things. So my question was, these commonalities we see across, you know, geographic borders, uh -huh. is, it, is there a connection here? Is it something to do with universal consciousness is there something in our dna do you have no i think it, I, it, it's certainly certainly that's part of it but i i trace it back to a, to a universal culture that there was a global advanced civilization during the ice age uh, that it was all but completely wiped out in cataclysms between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, but that there were survivors and that they passed down a, a common legacy all around the world. And we see the manifestation, the reworking, the reincarnation, the, the resurrection of those ideas in many different uh, ancient civilizations, which appear to be unconnected. But if you go back far enough to the very roots, you find that they are connected through the shared influence of a lost civilization okay um boy we don't have a lot of time left do we um hello there you're on the air it's midnight and you're on the air good afternoon uh, oh good uh, good morning actually good morning from uh from scotland uh welcome uh, scotland. Uh, are you how are you doing my i'm friend? doing very well thank you wonderful uh, to have you back on the air thank you we uh, don't have a lot of time so hit us with a question the question, all right, this is going to blow everybody. Um, 
Would you comment on uh, Graham? Thank you for coming on. Would you comment on uh, the idea that there are two sphinxes, and mm -hmm. that indeed the um, the sphinxes aren't lions but dogs, mm -hmm. because I they're in the Guardians of the Gate. I, I, the I of the gate. Okay, hold on. I definitely don't think the sphinx is a dog. Uh, I think that's a, that's a mistaken idea, connecting the Sphinx to Anubis, the Psychopompo Guide of Souls. I think the Sphinx has always been a lion. I think it was at one point entirely a lion, uh, and that its head was reworked into human form uh, during the historical period by uh, Egyptian pharaohs, but that the body is a much better. And the connections of the Sphinx to the constellation of Leo at the equinox uh, takes us back to that epoch of 12,500 hundred years ago when the world was going through a turbulent and traumatic change. So I have no doubt about the Leon, Leonine connection. Many ancient uh, artworks show us two sphinxes, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if under the sands of the desert a second sphinx awaits discovery. Really? You yeah. really think there may be a second? Oh yes, I think it's very it's very likely uh, that there's a that there's a second sphinx. In fact, on the UK cover of my new book, I show two sphinxes. The American cover is different, but the content of the book is the same in both cases. And let me ask: if the audience are are interested in what I've said, and if you want to help my work, please pre-order Magicians of the Gods. Just go to GrahamHancock.com, go to the Magicians of the Gods page, and you'll see the possibility of pre-ordering there. You'll strengthen me. You'll strengthen my book you'll give me a chance in the argument uh, if you do that. Oh, I think there are many who will wish to do that. Um, very quickly, let me try Lewis on Skype. Lewis, hello there. You're on the air. It's midnight. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi. I'm sorry. I'll make this oh, quick. Okay, you're going to have to get very close to your microphone. Listen to me. Listen to me. You're going to have to get very close to your microphone. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Go ahead. Um, I want to know about Ganon Padang in Java, Indonesia, if you could give us a quick update. Thanks for asking that. Uh, Gunung Padang is a 25,000-year-old pyramid in Indonesia, uh, which has been explored and investigated as the result of the work of an extraordinary Indonesian geologist called Danny Hillman. And I have made three visits to Gunung Padang, extensive research visits. Uh, this is the most extraordinary site in the world today, and I cover it in depth in my book, Magicians of the Gods. Well, all right. Um it, it is um, perhaps a little early. I, I, it's such a pleasure having you on the program. Graham, you've got to come back. You've absolutely I, got to come back. I would love to come back, Art. It's a delight to talk to you. It's been many years. It's great to hear your voice. I'm so glad you're back on the air. I wanted to, to, to give you that solidarity. I regard you as an old friend, a great broadcaster, and I'm so glad that you're back on the airwaves sharing your wisdom. Thanks, buddy. We'll do it again. Okay. Good night. Good night. All right. That's it. That's it for tonight. We're just simply out of time. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful night, and we'll do it again tomorrow. This magical journey will take us on a ride. You put the long and that will bring us to the end of the day as well. Thank you, Art Bell and Graham Hancock. From the very first Midnight in the Desert episode that was ever done. And thank you, Miss Gail. And I will take you off. And with that, of course, please make sure you do help us get to that 50,000 views, 1,000 subscribers. Boxy sends us nice red boxes. And Google puts us on the algorithms. Until tomorrow, like, share, and subscribe. Be kind to one another and have a great night's rest. As we march along this night and every overnight here from day one. Have a great evening. Again, enjoy your night's rest. We'll see you tomorrow. New event should be coming up here on Thursday.